welcome Tom to uh, to my next interview. Your first one, obviously. But um, as I'm going around the the company, the the top hundred engineers, as we've we've called out, um, you guys all had to kind of go through the uh, the expert program, both L6 and L7, in a relatively short amount of time uh, to kind of test that. So first thing I want to say is uh, not just welcome, but congratulations. You uh, you went through it. Um, congratulations on being one of the top hundred engineers. That's a pretty big thing too. We got a, we got a lot of smart people in the company. So, uh, being designated for that, just to give it a shot was one thing, but to actually go through and, and pass them both, um, anybody would have passed either one would be a, an accomplishment. And we actually feel that most people would probably do that with a year between, but, um, we gave you guys a little harder challenge and, and you stepped up to the plate. So congrats and, uh, welcome. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, I want to start off with, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about who is Tom? Where'd you come from? What your career looked like? You know, work us up to Arista and then we'll, we'll talk about Arista a little bit as, as well. Yeah. Thanks, Terry. So Tom Frandy, I am a senior customer engineering manager here at Arista, coming on eight years uh, on the Arista side. But prior to joining Arista, I was on the customer side um, since I graduated from college. I got my bachelor's degree in, in networking technology um, master's in technology management from Central Connecticut State University. So I interned when I was in college in the IT field and, you know, worked at a, cus a couple of uh, companies on the customer side. So I was on the customer side, evaluating, seeing how different vendors operated, seeing how different companies ran their networks. And then when I got the opportunity to uh, join Arista and now help customers uh, build networks and 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 guide them through designs and understand their challenges and pain points and and help them find the right solutions for that. Um, it's it's been an absolute joy. Yeah. So so what was the um so so college a couple customers and then uh, what what caught you to jump in Arista? Just how'd that story go? That's always an interesting story when I ask that. Yeah, no. So it's it's interesting. So I was part of the team that evaluated Arista from uh, being uh, deployed in the network. So, you know, I've worked at, you know, the couple of customers that I, w I worked at, you know, I got exposure to pretty much every networking vendor out there. And I just really enjoyed Arista's approach. And at the end of the day, Ar Arista just works. And, mm -hmm. and I lived and breathed that as a customer. I used to do change windows, major changes at two, three o'clock in the morning. And the account team was part of like part of our team and the company, the account team never let me down. So I just really enjoyed the culture of the company, the quality of the product and the fact that it just worked to the point where I wouldn't even entertain talking to any networking vendor just because I knew Arista would always have my back and have the have the network uh, running smooth and, and sound. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that we say that, you know, and and. It's it's a common phrase inside in in our culture, I guess you could say. It's um, you know, it just works and absolutely sounds like marketing, you know, coming from us. But it, you guys, none of you guys I have on these interviews are marketing guys at all. You're you're just <laughs> you're just engineers. You roll up your sleeve. I know I know all of you work with all of you on different projects and things. And you know, we're this is kind of a this is not where we're shouting a party line necessarily. Um, it's a true statement and. I love how sometimes, you know, I, I heard that coming on and now I hear it coming from customers of, you know, we're the most boring vendor, you know, nothing, nothing breaks, things just work, you know, and it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, philosophy to see, see people come back and go, you know, can we get a discount on maintenance because nothing broke last year? Like it's, it's always an interesting kind of story that what, but what a cool problem to, you know, to kind of have from a vendor point of view is that that is how trustworthy our code and, and our hardware. But I think it's the last piece of, of it that uh, gets missed sometimes is it's also how we approach architecture. It's how you and I and all the rest of us, you know, approach designing, you know, using EVPN and using different technologies and, and keeping those things simple that I think help make the code and the hardware more stable because we're just not putting a bunch of nonsense in the network. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would say it's just to add on to that too, is just the overall customer experience. You know, I've always on the customer side of things, you know, you're approached by different vendors, uh, resellers, and, and, you know, I, I'm someone that, you know, truly cares about the customer. So I would never want to position things that were going to, you know, make the customer's life harder or uh, something that I would, you know, 
would have to just support day in and day out, but just the overall customer experience. And if you need help, Arista is there to help you. You can call the tack. It's a hassle-free model. It just um, truly a game changer in, in my opinion, in my experience. Yeah, just the amount of resources that we bring in from from every aspect of whoever picks up the phone and tack carries you all the way through to an SE that could write your automation scheme if necessary to, you know, yeah. people from the product side and the software side are willing to jump on a call and hear what you hear, what the issue is and, and really talk about a feature request or adjustment, stuff like that. I mean, it's just a, a holistic uh, kind of approach. So, so tell me the eight years you've been at Arista. So what's that evolution? Like, what'd you start as, where are you at now? What was in the middle? Yeah. So I joined as an SE on a pre-sale side and moved into uh, leadership, uh, I got the opportunity to move into leadership in the Northeast U.S. And what's really cool about the way Arista uh, does leadership, um, the, the leadership model anyways, is all the leaders at Arista are functional leaders. So I may be the leader of the team, but I also have my own customers. So it gives, it keeps keeps us in, in uh, pers- keeps perspective for us and keeps our, our skill sets sharp. And, um, you know, that, that's something I've, I've truly enjoyed. It's, it's been great to be part of building the team and growing, growing the business. And now that, you know, I'm, you know, moving from just, you know, directly, you know, leading the team in the Northeast U.S., I've had the opportunity to have larger impacts outside of just my region and have global impact, which I've truly enjoyed just working with different leaders, different, different individuals across the organization and just, you know, you can see that just the, the great Arista culture across the board. So I've really enjoyed that, been part of a lot of initiatives to, um, you know, have a large impact on the company and and just see the the growth of, of the organization and, and the success has been has been great. Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting story, interesting time that we have right now. You know, we're you know, most people know our story. We started out with the, the big global financials and cloud titans and you know big big customers that we went into where our story just absolutely resonated and made sense and it was it was it was an easy decision um and now we're now we're spreading out to to the, all the rest um now we start to get into problems where you know it's a story that we have in the u.s the same as the story we have in asia is it the same is it the same customer problem is it the same customer request are we solving the same problems um, and that's, that's always been, you know, with, with other vendors that I've worked with, you know, some of our competitors in the past, this is, this is stuff that where you have to spend a lot of time and effort to, to make sure that our core message is not just going to one customer segment. And I mean, and, and in my experience looking around, we have probably a better chance of solving that or preventing that from than anybody else I've seen, because we actually do talk to each other. You know, I mean, there's. We're, we're a company like any other company, and we got things that we got we're challenges and stuff we're working through. But generally speaking, the SE community, um, and and for a good part, the SE to the account manager community, um, we we actually do communicate with each other pretty well across the board. So we can have those messages and get them out. You know what we're doing in campus in the U.S. might be a little slightly different approach than what we're doing in in Asia in some customers. You know, one's partner driven, one's not partner driven. You know, different aspects of that. So it's. I think that's cool. And to see you kind of rise up and, and be on our, our leadership call and kind of leading that. And um, a lot of big personalities and big, uh, big talent, you know, skill sets in there. And yeah, we're all, we're all still banging around. So, well, tell Absolutely. me about, um, you know, your experience with doing the, the L6 and L7. I mean, I, well, I'll be transparent. We actually have done a lot of stuff in the past. So you've seen most of our program. You've had most of your guys go through the program. Uh, we even did a little demo like two years ago where you actually taught at, at your alma mater, I guess. Is that? Yes. We got to go back and we did a, a kind of networking course there to kind of test out our platform and things like that. And um, so we've, we've been doing things together for a long time. You've actually been a pretty big part of uh, the training organization. Somebody I went to early on to get feedback and, and make sure that we were hitting the right topics that you know, not only we wanted our employees to hear, but our customers to hear too. And that's, uh, that, that's something I, I – I feel I did a little unique here was we wouldn't have conversations with you guys. I really wanted to represent the voice of the customer in it. And, and I think we've done a pretty good job with that, but now having gone all the way through from one end to the other, yeah, I mean, teaching the bottom level at the college that time. And now you finish six and seven. Um, how do we do? How do you, how do you think? Yeah. I know it's a video and you know, yeah, you're talking to me and you, but uh, <laughs> seriously, how, how do we do? Give me, give me your, your true thoughts on it. 
Yeah, so it's it's been interesting. So me personally, I you know not nothing against you know certifications, but I I've never been someone that's really gone after industry certifications. You know, I I you know grew up going through my bachelor's and master's and curriculum followed in the networking side. You know, the cert track from other vendors, and for me, it was all about you know getting your hands dirty and just making it work and understanding and being as real world as possible. So when I got the exposure. And the opportunity to, you know, teach, you know, the beta versions of, of the uh, Arista training content to, you know, at the university level, I got the experience and the messaging that was being delivered to the, to the students and seeing, seeing the positive feedback and seeing the students really learn things that are really going to help them and the, truly help them in their real world jobs, um, you know, definitely sparked my interest. And when I had the opportunity to go through the L6 and L7 you know, it just, it just was compounded by the fact that it was all just, you know, real stuff that I face as not only that I face as a customer, but now that I face with my customers. So going through the six and having to actually look at, you know, a real world scenario where you're responding to an RFP, which, you know, many folks in this industry are going to have to either put out to their vendors that they're looking for a solution or, you know, answer that if they're on the sales side and to see that, you know, in, in a real world scenario, and go through the motions of understanding requirements, putting a solution together, and going through it. You know, a true full blown RFP is um, many time. You know, in some ways, might have been a little bit painful, <laughs> um, but it was it was definitely worthwhile. And then to you know start there first, and then go to seven and say, okay, let me let me build this thing out. Let me make sure that this design actually truly works. And do it from, you know, the CLI level to make sure that I understood, you know, what I was actually doing. And then, you know, the second part of that is let's now automate the whole thing because automation is so important and so impactful um, in in the industry today. So it was just, it was great to see, you know, a high level um, exam and certification be based around real world scenarios that if you can master that as an engineer, then you will be put in the position to be extremely successful, um, whether you're on the customer side or the uh, sales side. And, and I think that's um, that's maybe the best compliment I could take out of it is that you know inside of what you just said, there's there's really no no difference between what we do with a customer and what we do on the exam. Exactly. And, and we 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 took a lot of time. Um, it took a little longer to get out to market than what we had originally had hoped, but. We, we um, you know, another culture thing for us is we're going to do quality. We're going to do it right. So we took the time to try to get that right. And yeah, we, we scoured through just stacks of RFPs and, and we took things out of each of them and combined them together. Not, not looking for those one-off crazy things that, that, you know, one in a thousand customers might ask. We were looking for the things that were in every single one. Yeah. And what it wasn't about like, yeah, it wasn't about, you know, what's the exact syntax to do X, Y, Z. It was, hey, you can use whatever resources you want to sure. find what you need. It's just, you know, a matter of, you know, you understanding and putting the right thought um, into building the design, answering the questions and and actually making it all work. So, you know, I think the, that focus is just going to make it, you know, uh, mo most valuable to the folks that go through it because those they're going to be able to use those skills and truly know that they were measured on real world skills, you know, in their, in their careers. Yeah. You know, it's, I was, um, I was on with, uh, Naveen and when this gets posted, he either has already been posted or he'll be coming after it. But, uh, you know, in the interview with him and talked about, it, and he said something I just think is brilliant and, and just captured kind of what I've been trying to do so much is he's like, you know, there's some programs out there that, that test you on facts and there's this program that tests you on skills. And, you know, it's a really interesting thing. I, we, we actually grade less on what you um, have completed in L6, for example, than what you have asked in L6. The questions you ask, the things that you do, those are the most important to us because we want to we wanna try to flush out where are you coming from? Why are you, why are you doing this? The questions define, you know, and, you know, and as I've watched a lot of the rest of the guys go through, yeah, it is a pain in the butt. And as you guys go through these and you're asking the questions, you're also, I'm sitting there grinning because every question you ask, I know you're learning something out of it too. So you're just getting stronger and stronger, but go ahead. Yeah, Terry. And that, that you bring up a, a good point. So, you know, one of the 
one of the things that I get to do, which I really enjoy is, you know, screening candidates and building the team out. And, and you would be surprised that, you know, some of these candidates that come through and I see resumes of, you know, some, you know, pretty, you know, impressive, you know, certifications, right. You would think, and the certifications on paper don't match up what their skill sets are. So what yeah. I started to do early on is I actually put candidates through a lab and, and so very basic lab, not so much. Do you know the syntax for this or that? It's very similar to what you're doing here to say, do you really understand the fundamentals and what we're trying to do here? Um, and the fact that this whole program is built around, you know, real skills, real, you know, real world examples is just, is just gr great to see. Yeah. I think it's cool too, that, um, it's, you know, if, if we're going to say that this, this is centered around building real world skills, um, it's, it's also not necessarily building just real world Arista skills. You know, that's kind of the cool thing about us as a vendor, since we're doing everything open source. I mean, you're, you're building Ansible skills, period. You, you can use those wherever you want. You know, you're building EVPN and BGP skills. Syntax might be a little different from one box to another, but literally you're, if you can understand and build EVPN and get through L7 with it, you can understand and build EVPN probably with any vendor that you want to. So it's, we really kind of took that focus and yes, we got certain things like cloud vision that we are absolutely going to have as part of our, our, you know, stuff that is, you know, as close as we can get to proprietary. But once you jump into cloud vision, you actually find out there's not a whole lot of proprietary in cloud vision either. A lot of that's open stack. It just, it's just our branding, our product, but, um, we really try to stick to the things that are there at a core across the board so that when people are coming out of this, that um, this is why we call it, we, 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 we try to stop calling them exams, but I mean, everybody's called it exam for forever. It's always going to be called an exam, but you know, we we're trying to brand this as their, their operational readiness evaluations. Um, that's the message we're trying to take back to our customer base and say, Hey, if you, if you want to invest and in taking your people through the program, then what we owe you at the end is a is an operational check to see if those skill sets are ready to go so we can tell you hey that guy's probably good tier one ops guy that guy's probably you know a tier three ops guy that guy is probably a lead for your your change windows you know and and i think that's that's our way as a vendor to turn around and say we're we're helping to prepare you um you know can do to set it and i've said this probably every third video but you know, it's, it's a huge statement and, and has been a big impact to me is, you know, I love when smart people use our equipment. It's, it's a horrifying statement when I heard him say it the first time. And yet it's a huge challenge is that, you know, we do have open equipment and in my years in the industry, you know, if you go back and look at the old protocols, like, you know, ISIS versus OSPF, um, most people will say ISIS is harder. Um, it's actually depends on the perspective. If you're looking at memorization, it's easier because there's not as much to memorize, far more rules to memorize in OSPF. OSPF may be easier to get working because if you don't get the rules right, it just doesn't work at all. So if you get it to work, you, you got it functionally to happen. ISIS, you can kind of make it do whatever the heck you want it to do. So usually the ones that are open and flexible are the more difficult to learn. And we've kind of taken that approach across the board to say, you know, BGP, EVPN, VXLAN, Ansible, Python, you know, none of these are small topics. These are huge topics, right? And why not just hit it right down the window? Why do I need to, to go bring up some obscure feature set that BGP can bring to the table that nobody ever uses? Why do that? EVPN and BGP is hard enough by it is, you know, by the, by the alone is the right way to say that. So what, what do you think as far as, you know, the perception that people might have that we let you do this as an open book? You know, you can come in, you can ask, you know, you, you can bring whatever resources you want to on your laptop. We're not going to lock down your machine. We don't do that for any exam and all of our exams are hands on. Um, but does that make this expert easy? Yeah, I would say it It really puts the focus on what it should be. It's not so much, you know, s syntax memorization, but more so, you know, do you operational readiness? Like you said, are, are you, do you, do you have the skill sets to, you know, make it to, um, you know, whatever level in the organization you need to and, and be measured on your understanding and, and skills of making the network work at a certain level versus, you know, syntax memorization or fact memorization. It's all about your experience, your skills. And, you know, when you walk into the exam, 
you know, that's what the focus should be. Not, okay, let me, let me take out my flashcards and memorize the syntax for these right. show commands or whatever. So, yeah, I think it's, I think it puts the focus where it needs to be uh, and make it, make it truly what, you know, the intention is to have it be a real, real world example in the real world, you know, you have the access to whatever resources you need typically. So yeah. um, there's no games played. It's all about, you know, you know, building a, a, a relevant network uh, that, that, that everyone would, would use in any major organization today. Yeah. I think that's, that's a, that's a huge kind of caveat and, and difference with us is there, there are no games. I, I like the way you said that there's, there's no games played at all here. I mean, to me, if you can automate a leaf spine network with BGP and EVPN and VXLAN, um, and you can do that across the board, um, that is a pretty major skill set to have. Um, now, if you can do that, and you get the normal curves that Murphy will throw on you at any given time that you're doing this kind of stuff, and you can get it to work. You know, you can troubleshoot your way out of it. You can understand it enough that you can go back and tweak it. Um, then you're you're demonstrating the skills that we want to see now. You know, does that cover every corner case that's sitting out there? No, but that's that's what we train TAC for. That's not what most people ever will have to see, and and I think it breaks a lot of bad habits. Is you know, I've I've looked at things for for years. I've had the same hiring challenges you've had, and oh great, you come out, you got one expert or two or three experts or multi vendor experts, and and then I'm I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what you know how to do. You know, you've been out of college for ten minutes. You got you got two experts you know, under your belt. I have no idea what you're going to do when I turn you loose on a production environment because I'm not sure you learned what not to do. I think you've learned some some things that you might have to do to pass that exam, but um, there's a lot of stuff on the exam that should never be in a production environment, you know, a lot of times. And we really wanted to take the step to kind of not do that, to make sure that we don't really have a best practice to say because we support multiple things. And hey, if you want to use ISI as your underlay instead of EBGP, that's fine with us. I mean, typically we might go out and start the conversation with EBGP, but if you got the right use case for ISI, then by all means use ISI and we'd support it. Um, so it's it's a recommended practice, not a best practice. But if you can go out there and make that work, or if in L6 you can recommend it and you can support why you want to do that and you can say, hey, I chose this because this was the people and this is the skill set I have and blah, da 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 um, Those are all the right answers. And we don't need to try to trick you out of it. I mean, time and pressure and all this stuff is is already there. And and I think we've done a pretty good job to do that. I used to, to coach a lot of people getting CCIE and be like, all right, here's what you do, you know, two months out. Here's what you do six weeks out. Here's what you do four weeks out. All the way down to a hey, go to the hotel, take this with you. Don't bring your wife, no kids, no dogs. Like, go there, sleep overnight. You know, do all these things because you're you're just trying to manage people through a ridiculously, you know, stressful situation. Not only have you dropped a lot of money, not only a lot of everybody knows they're going to take the exam and waiting for the results, and you know it's a huge amount of pressure. And then if you blow it, you got to do the whole thing over again. Um, we we knew we wanted to get across skill set mix uh we didn't want to have silos there should be no such thing as a data center expert and then a campus expert and then a wi-fi expert and um we see most of our customers kind of hey this is the same people that are building campus or building data center that are doing automation they're all the same people participating uh, how do we cover all those realms and still not make it tricky and and i think we did that you know even if you fail this exam we do the three parts um to keep it realistic um, so that you have a change window per each functional part, just like you would in real world. If you get data center up and running today, forget about it. It's done. Now, go get campus running next weekend. Get that, boom. Go automate the rest of the network the following weekend. Do those things in pieces. If you if you get data center and then you fail campus, you don't have to go back and take data center again. Just take the campus part again, just like you would in a change window. Now, I think that's fair because we also grade it that way. Uh, our grading is no points. Is It's very simple would you turn this on a Monday morning or would you have to roll back to Friday? If you have to roll back, you failed. If you turn it on Monday, you pass. And we keep it that simple. Does it work? So it's, it's harder, but in some ways, hopefully a little less stressful from the artificial stress anyway. Yes, absolutely. Well, closing this out, man, you, uh, we got people coming behind you watching this, maybe a little interested, just hearing about, you know, this program for the first time. 
Um, anything you want to offer up? Any advice? Any warnings? You know, obviously don't give away the goodies, but um, <laughs> just just generally speaking, what what would you offer out to the world? Yeah, I would just say it's. Yeah, I would highly recommend it. In in you know, Terry, you hit hit the you know point well. If you can automate an EVPN VXLAN network and you know end to end campus data center, you know it doesn't matter. You don't need to be a you know syntax memory expert. <laughs> It's all about real world experience and things that you're going to do in any organization, whether you are on the customer side or you're on the pre-sale side, you're going to go through RFPs. You're going to be writing them or answering them. You're going to have to help a customer through a design and making this work, or you're going to be on the, on the customer side yourself to do it. So I would definitely embrace it. I would definitely highly recommend that you go through it. And it's, um, these are skill sets that are going to carry you throughout your career, um, you know, for, for a long, long time. So um, I would highly recommend it to uh, anyone in the, in the networking field. Well, I appreciate that. And I'll, I'll have one last closing statement that, that I have been putting on because I want this to go out. I don't care if I repeat it every video. I want everybody to hear it over and over and over. Um, the blueprint, the study for these two exams is relatively simple. It's levels one through five. We don't have anything on six and seven. Um, six and seven don't have a class right now. We do have some thoughts about whether or not we'll put out kind of a boot camp to kind of get keep people focused in the future. But right now there's there's no class requirement for six and seven. Um, but everything that you need to know has been taught in one through five. So no secret documents, no stuff that you got to go learn somewhere else, no books you need to go buy. It's you got the skills. If you're if you're missing EVPN, then we suggest L3. If you're missing automation, we suggest L5. You know, if you're missing, you know, WAN stuff like MPLS, things like this, level four. It's very simple. Um, if you need all three of those, then take all three of those. Uh, but otherwise, there's there's no trickery on it. It's it's just straightforward. Just like you said, it almost sounds too easy. So all I got to do is just go get good at EVPN and BGP and and VXLAN, and I'll be able to pass. Yeah. Matter of fact, if you can go get good on those three things. Your career is going to be great too. It's not just you're going to pass the exam. You you'll move into senior engineer very very quickly because that is the skill set that we see in every one of our customers. And um, even though we don't have every customer in the world, there's really no other choice. You can either pick some of the vendors out there, proprietary shots for what they do in data center, or you can roll out EVPN. That's pretty much it. Doesn't matter what vendor you're going to. That's that's kind of the shake of it. So these are skills that should carry for a long time. Should be something that 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 people can grow on, people can can you know progress to, and I I don't think EVPNs. We're going to retire, Tom, before EVPN goes away. It's not going anywhere, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, but hey, man, I really enjoy the conversation. Appreciate you you jumping Thanks, on and doing this and and passing on uh, uh, both your story and and um, and your advice and just a, a a good conversation. I'm hoping that people see that we're just regular guys and gals. We just we sit down and study like everybody else. We do this day in day out. Uh, we lab every day. We 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 work on these things. We practice. We become proficient, and um, and that's how we got where we're at. So we just want to pass that on to everybody else that anybody out there can do the same thing. Absolutely appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. All right, Tom. Good talking to you, man, and uh, and good luck with everything in the future. All right. Likewise. Thanks, Terry.